this morning on the subject, the spirit of rebellion. The spirit of rebellion. And it is a spirit. We're going to deal with it this morning by the grace of God. Let's pray. Now, Father, I need you. I need you, Holy Spirit, to come and make these words life and truth because it's only truth that sets us free. Only truth. There's nothing else that can free the soul but truth, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus, cleanse me, sanctify me, purge me. Let me stand here before you under the blood and let me proclaim your living word, not out of my flesh, not out of self, but out of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I acknowledge, Holy Spirit, that I can't preach this this morning without you. Nothing will go beyond this pulpit. It will fall flat on the floor unless you take it with wings of the Holy Spirit and bring it to our minds and bring it to our hearts and make it life and conviction. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Rebellion. Now, rebellion is the rising up of against established authority. And a rebel is someone who tries to ruin or destroy, pull down that authority. Now, I have a mandate from God this morning to expose any kind of seed of rebellion that may be in this house today. You may be a visitor from some other country. You may be from another church. But I want to talk to you about the seed of rebellion. You say, well, Pastor, that that bothers me that you would suggest that I might have the seed of rebellion in me because I don't have one iota of rebellion in me. I thank God for the leadership of this church. I'm not trying to bring down anybody's authority. I'm under subjection, so there's not an iota of rebellion in me. Because remember the definition of rebellion, the rising up against established authority. You say, that's not me. I can't even conceive of it, and I don't want you to put that burden on me. But let me talk to you about the kind of rebellion that the Holy Spirit is interested in and is dealing with this morning. It's rebellion against the greatest established authority to mankind. That is this book, the living, revealed Word of God. When we disobey this in any part of our life, we are in the beginning of rebellion. Rebellion is against the established authority of this book, the revealed Word of the Lord, the Holy Scriptures. Any believer who will not fully, completely obey what he reads in this Scripture... He may obey 98% of the time, but if even in 2% of his life he is walking in disobedience to something clearly commanded or revealed in this book, he is living in rebellion against established authority. Now, the spirit of rebellion uh, is very clear in the life of Saul. Uh, You don't need to turn there, but in 1 Samuel, uh, the 12th chapter begins to pick up the story. And I want to show you in the life of Saul how rebellion comes and what it does, the final results and the ruin that is caused by a spirit of rebellion. God came very clearly to Saul and gave him incredible, clear direction. When Israel chose Saul to be king, they gathered together and Samuel began to speak to them. And this is what Samuel said to Saul and all the people after they'd chosen a king, naming Saul. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice, obey his voice. It was that simple. If you will simply keep your ear open and your eyes open, and if you will be careful to hear what the Lord says and obey my voice and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. That's where rebellion starts. Disobeying a clearly revealed word of God. The, if you rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both you and the king continue following the Lord. He said, if you'll not rebel, if you just obey his voice, I'll let your, I'll let your kingdom continue forever. I will not take my spirit from you. I will bless you. I will give you my favor. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, Samuel said, but rebel against the commandments of the Lord, thou shalt be, thou shalt, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you. And here Samuel identifies disobedience to the word of the Lord as rebellion. 
Any disobedience to this book, any disobedience to the word of the prophet at that time, the revealed word of God, any disobedience was considered rebellion against God. Now, the Philistines invaded Judah and Israel with 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and a great multitude of infantrymen and, and uh, the Bible says as, as the sands of the sea, there was a, a multi, multi thousand uh, infantry coming against the children of Israel. Now Saul was commanded by God to wait at Gilgal and not, not even lift his sword, not make one move against the Philistines until Samuel arrived and offered sacrifice to the Lord to obtain his blessings. He was to wait seven days. He waited seven days and Samuel didn't appear. And on the seventh day, later toward the evening, Saul said, I can't wait any more. He said, my troops are forsaking me. They're hiding in caves. They're running across the border. They're going to other countries and I'm losing my army. So he called for the sacrifice. He himself slew the lamb and sacrificed unto the Lord. He had no sooner done this and Samuel appears and said, Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. Now the kingdom shall, thy kingdom shall not continue, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. You disobeyed the word of the Lord. It was clear. You were told what to do. You took it upon yourself to do what you choose. Samuel said, Saul, if you had only obeyed God's word, He would have established your kingdom upon Israel forever, for the Lord was looking for a man after his own heart. So he's saying here, a man after God's own heart is simply one who obeys the word of God explicitly. He does not question it. He does not justify his actions. He conforms his life to the living word of God. He doesn't go out of those boundaries. The word of God is the stay of his life. That's the direction. The revealed word of God. The revealed word of God had come to Saul. He knew exactly what to do, but he went his own way. Now, folks, there's no mystery, there's no secret on how to obtain and keep God's favor and blessing on one's life. You see people who have the favor of God, the blessing of God, the anointing of God. And you see others who are living clearly in disfavor with the Lord. His blessing, his anointing is not upon them. The Spirit of the Lord has departed from their life. There's no mystery And how to keep God's favor in your life. Where everybody knows it. Favor with God. Favor with man. The blessing of God in everything you say and everything you do. Your words don't fall to the ground. There's no mystery to it. It's very, very simple. Those who are after God's heart, are not simply because they pray more or some kind of greater devotion. It's simply that they fear the word of God. Now the fear of God is nothing more than absolute awe and reverence for his word. He's honored his word above his name. This book is not just a compilation of stories that, that you can pick and choose. Every word, every word of this book is to conform us to the, to the very image of God, the image of Christ, so that we can obtain his favor and blessing in our life. And those who have the favor and the blessing of God are simply obedient children to the word of the Lord. Obedience to this book. This is, there's no secret to it. Now, 14 years later, Saul is given another opportunity to obey the Lord. 14 years have gone by, and in this 14 years, Saul has lost the favor of God. He's turning to a madness, an inner madness. He has a jealous, envious spirit. And this man is beginning to lose control. But God gives him another opportunity. This is 14 years later. And Saul was given very clear direction again to go against the Amalekites. And Saul was told by Samuel in such clear words. I'll read it to you now. Go and smite Amalek. Utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Slay everything. Let nothing remain. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatlings of the lambs and all that was good and all that 
and, and would not destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Samuel was praying. And God comes to him and reveals what Saul and the people had done. He hadn't been in the battle, not even a word from the battle, revelation from God. And God came to Samuel and he, he said to Samuel, in fact, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, it repents me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me. He's not performed my commandments. He's not kept my word. Samuel meets Saul. Samuel cries out at the king. He said, King Saul, the Lord sent you on a journey. And he said to you, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites until they be consumed. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And why did you do this evil in the sight of the Lord? And what was the evil? Simply disobedience to the revealed word of God. Now let me stop here for a minute and try to get into the mind of Saul and why he justified what he did because the justification that Saul used is being used today by most Christians who disobey the Lord. It's the same thing. Saul was saying to himself, I know, look, God sent me on a dangerous mission. Now, I have sacrificed and I've given my all. I have labored. I have been sweating. I took my life in my own hands. I've been sleeping in caves. I've been sleeping on the hard ground. I've been eating coarse food. I have literally laid my life on the line. I have been sacrificing for God. I did what he told me. He said, go to battle. I've gone to battle. I have been fighting the Lord's battle. All right, I've made a few mistakes. All right, I disobeyed in this one area. But surely, all this sacrifice of mine, all that I've done for God, surely he's not overlooking that. God, perceiving what is in his heart, the Holy Spirit perceiving, comes with this answer from the lips of Samuel. Saul, so hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than to the fat of lambs? Now I want you to hear it, please. God can call you to do a work, whether you're a pastor, missionary, evangelist, or a worker in a church. God sent you to do something. God commanded you and you obeyed. You went out. You, you are sacrificing. You could be in the middle of a sacrifice that would literally cost you a life. You could lay your life down as a living sacrifice. You give your body, so to speak, is to be burned at the stake. And you can be sacrificing and working for the Lord. And you're obeying the general command of God. But in one area of your life where God has spoken so clearly to you, you have failed to obey the Lord in this area. I'm telling you, all the sacrifice in the world will not tip the scales. All the sacrifice in the world, all of your hard work, you can argue with God, but God, I, you told me to go, I went, I'm doing everything you told me to do, I've, I've taken so much guff from people, I've done so many good things, I have worked my fingers to the bone. Didn't you say in the word that you, you not forget our labor of love? No, folks, he won't forget your labor of love. But if you are disobeying the Lord against that which is clearly commanded in this scripture, he, he said, it's better that you obey me on that area than do all of these sacrificial things for me because your obedience is better than your sacrifice. He said, I'm looking for obedience to my clearly revealed word to you. Now God's not going to look at your sacrifice. You can be right now in the middle of that kind of, of total surrender of your life, but because of this area of disobedience to a clear commandment of Jesus Christ, you can come into his disfavor. Now God, through the lips of Samuel, called rebellion as the sin of witchcraft. First Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion, this is in the same context, the same conversation. Samuel, first Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Now folks, listen to me. I entitled this message this morning, The Spirit of Rebellion, 
Because rebellion is born out of a witchcraft seduction. Witchcraft. Now, the word witchcraft, the definition of witchcraft, an irresistible influence leading to deception. An irresistible influence of seduction. It causes those who are under it to believe a lie to be the truth. Now, the spirit that possessed Saul finally exposed itself when he went to the witch of Endor. We know that he was under the witchcraft, the seduction of a spirit that caused him to believe that, that, that he could do what he pleased. He could ignore the commandments of God and still say that I've obeyed God. He's convinced that he's in obedience. The sorcery causes the person to believe that he's obeying God when in fact he's living in outright rebellion. He could look Samuel right in the eye and say, I've obeyed the Lord. I did what you told me. And Samuel says, what's the beating of the sheep? What's all the sound of the lowing of the cows that I hear? You didn't slay them. And what's this with King Agag? And Samuel takes a sword and slays and hews King Agag to pieces. Now, I don't know whether he did it or one of his servants, but God, Samuel said, let me tell you what I want you to do about your secret sin. Let me tell you what I want to do about anything in your flesh that's against God. You take the sword and you slay it and you don't spare anything. You come against everything in your life that would hold you out of the communion of Christ. He, he was trying to show the whole church age how to deal with besetting sin. You take it, you don't, you, you don't come and try to just win it over. You slay it. You take the sword of the word and you kill it. That's the lesson of Samuel Ewing, King Agag. Now, he, he could say, I've obeyed, I've fulfilled the commandment of the Lord, when in fact, Saul was living in total disobedience. Now, the delusion of satanic witchcraft has blinded the eyes of multitudes of Christians. There are Christians in the church today who are clearly, who, who have had a clear revelation of the commandments of Jesus, and yet they don't see their disobedience. They are bewitched in their disobedience. They are blinded, they're beyond reach, having eyes to see they don't see, and having ears to hear they don't hear. According to Jeremiah, this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. And when you have a rebellious heart, you become judicially blind, so that you can't see when you are living in disobedience. O oh, foolish people without any understanding, which have eyes to see and see not, and have ears and hear not. But this word, without understanding. Folks, when, when you live in disobedience in your life, the first thing you lose is discernment. A discernment about your own sin, discernment about the evil of sin, you begin to call evil good and good evil, and then you begin to flatter the wicked and condemn the righteous. Now let me zero in on this truth for a moment. Let's take, for example... The very clear commandment of our Lord about forgiveness. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither shall your Father forgive your trespasses. Now folks, nothing in the Bible could be clearer. Is anybody in doubt about what... Jesus is saying, these are the words of Christ. These are commandments of the Lord Jesus. Now, not only am I to forgive my brother who trespasses against me, I can't do it from my head. I can't do it half-heartedly. I have to do it with a full heart of repentance. The scripture goes on. Jesus said, if you... In fact, he gave the illustration of a man who was forgiven a great debt. Absolutely forgiven. Debt wipe free, multi, multi million dollars owed, and the man he owed it to freely forgave him. Then he goes to a man who owes him just a pittance, and he goes to him and chokes him and says, pay me. And the Bible says, when the man who had forgiven the great debt found out about it, he threw him in prison and gave him over to his tormentors. And then the scripture says, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also to you, if you from your hearts... Forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Now, folks, let me tell you, if you have a single root of bitterness in your heart, you have the seed of rebellion. 
You have a, you have a seed in you that will overthrow this authority so that you will bypass every direction about forgiveness. You will bypass it all. You will go your own way and then you become what the Bible calls embittered. Not just bitter, but embittered. That means set like concrete in your bitterness. So that you eat it, you sleep it, and you say to yourself, I don't care what anybody says, I know what they did to me, I've been hurt, I've been wounded, I've been cut so deep, and I cannot forgive this. And there are some of you sitting here right now in total disobedience to the Word of God. You are in rebellion to the Scriptures, and I say it honestly because God put this in my heart, and I'm telling you now because you have a root of bitterness against somebody that hurt you. And I'm telling you now, if that doesn't come out of your heart this morning, you are in rebellion, and rebellion leads to hard-heartedness or stiff-neckedness, as the Bible calls it, so that finally nothing can reach you. You are without understanding. You are blind. You are deaf. No prophet, no preacher, no evangelist. Nothing of the conviction of the Holy Ghost can touch your heart again because it is hard. Because there's a root of bitterness. Bitterness is another word for rebellion. Because bitterness should never be allowed in the first place. If you are obeying this scripture forgiving, and you have a flow of forgiveness in you, you can't allow bitterness to even take root. It's plucked up by its very roots. Who is it? You had a divorce. Is it the husband? Is it the wife? Are there children? Is it a brother? Is it a sister? Is it somebody in the church? Is somebody on the job? And you can't shake it out. You try, but every time you get up in the morning, there it is. And it haunts you. And it's there. There's a root there of bitterness. Folks, it has to come out because it leads to rebellion against this word. And you, you, you are obligated according to the scripture. To forgive even if you've not been asked for forgiveness. Even if the individual does not repent. You have to forgive from the heart, the scripture says, with no other motivation than the spirit of Jesus Christ in you. No matter what you've done. You haven't been nailed to a cross. Your hands haven't been bleeding. And yet he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You show me a Christian who harbors a root of bitterness and I'll show you one that's going to become so hard-hearted, so unforgiving, it will affect everything in their life. Folks, there are pastors, there are teachers, there are evangelists, there are missionaries, there are prophets, men who were gifted, men who are successful, who minister to blinded rebels. They, They minister the rebels out of a rebellious heart of their own. You say, Brother Dave, can pastors who are well-known evangelists that are that are on radio or television, teachers, prophets, can can they have rebellion in them and can they teach rebellion? Absolutely yes. Absolutely. I want to prove it to you this morning. Here's a truth that's absolutely vital for you to know. Lest you come under the teaching of a rebellious spirit. It's about ministers and Christian workers who disobey God in some area in their life. Either they hold a grudge, they hold to an unforgiving spirit, they refuse to pay the price to live a holy, separated life, and and they get so busy and they get so cold and the anointing is gone. And when you lose your anointing and you lose the touch of God, you lose the favor of God and man, men turn away from you, they don't turn to you for counsel anymore, they turn to somebody else. And a coldness sets into this minister or this Christian workers, and they're just going through the motions. They've lost something. They're not seeking God with all their heart. Or there may be an area of compromise in their life, and they're solely, the anointing is just leaking out of their vessels. And then somebody comes along with God's favor, very evident in their ministry and their life. God's favor is on them. The anointing of the Lord is clear and powerful. And because of that, they're respected by God's people. And this person, this Christian worker, this evangelist, this preacher, who has lost the anointing and lost the touch of God and lost his vision, allows a spirit of jealousy and envy to rise in the heart. 
But oh, brother, sister, there is envy. I've seen it all over the world. I've seen it on the mission field. I've seen it in churches here in America. Where, where somebody then rises up in the church, someone in authority rises up in a ministry because there's jealousy, there is envy, and they go off in some different direction because there's a spirit of rebellion that has come upon them because it is against everything in God's clearly revealed word that you dare not have bitter envying strife in your heart that it will destroy, absolutely destroy you. And so they go off and every other person in the auditorium, any other person in that ministry who has a rebellious spirit are attracted to them and off they go. They go off. But it, it, it is out of a spirit of envy and jealousy that these things begin to develop. And then this little group gets together and all oh, will you hear the sermons. You will hear strong preaching. You will hear, thus saith the Lord. You will hear so-called prophecies left and right. But not one word of it is from God because it was founded on a spirit of envy and jealousy, causing strife in the body. Now, folks, bitter envying and strife in their hearts, according to James 3.14, for where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. So nothing that is said or preached or prophesied is of God. Now, the prophet Hananiah became envious of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had influence among the people of God. This man stood up against Jeremiah before all the people. Jeremiah told those who were taken into captivity in Babylon, he said, you stay there, you build houses, send your kids to the school, get an education, and, and you're going to be there for 70 years, so settle in. And Hananiah, a prophet, he was a contemporary prophet with Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, Hananiah spoke unto me, in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priest and all the people. He said, this man withstood me, this prophet, and this jealous minister told the people, Jeremiah's wrong. You can't trust his word. In fact, Hananiah said, thus saith the Lord. He said, I've got the message. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, within two full years, I'm going to bring back into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house. I'll bring back the king of Judah and all the captives are coming home. Within two full years... Now, God didn't speak that. It's an outright uh, message from this man's own jealous, raging heart. Because they were there for 70 years. They didn't come back. God did not send this man. He spoke out of envy and rebellion. And here is what God said to Hananiah through the prophet, God's anointed vessel. God send you, Hananiah. But you make this people to trust in a lie. Behold, I will cast thee off from the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because that thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah died the same year. You will die because you taught rebellion. There are teachers of rebellion. The teachers of rebellion who, who will uh, make it easy for you to go on in your sin. They will justify any kind of action. They'll give you scriptures. They'll give you teaching. Folks, you can twist this scripture any way you want to if you take it out of context. You can encourage any rebel, any preacher who encourages, encourages rebellion against the word of God is a teacher of rebellion, the scripture says. And this was Hananiah. And Jeremiah, I want you to go to Jeremiah 28 with me, please. Just, I want you to see it there. Jeremiah 28. Now, folks, look at me for just a moment. How could these people know which message is right? Where, where, how do you discern God's anointed leadership? How do you discern what message is right and what message comes from rebellion? What is it that is going to, to cater to rebellion? And how does the ordinary person in a congregation discern the message that's right? Folks, it was very easy to discern Jeremiah's message as being right. Because he lines it up with Scripture from the very beginning of time. And here's the proof of it. 28th chapter, Jeremiah, verse 7 and 8. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all this people. This is Jeremiah 
said, I want to show you why my message is correct. I want to show you why you need to hear what I'm saying and you don't listen to these teachers of rebellion. The prophets that have been before me and before the of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. Now look at me, please. Jeremiah is saying, if you know God, if you know his word, if you have studied it up to this point, every prophecy that came that is from the throne of God always did the same thing. The word of the prophet was to provoke people to righteousness, to show them how God judges sin. It was not to flatter the people. Now, folks, oftentimes it said there's been a hard message comes from this pulpit. But, folks, I don't want this to be hard in the flesh. But this prophet could be trusted because he was doing what every other prophet did from the beginning of time. He warned the people. He was trying to line them up to the very essence of what God says, the, the principles of God and how God acts. Because when a nation sins, it's going to face pestilence and judgment. And prophet Jeremiah said, from the beginning of time, this has been the message of the prophets. This has been the call of prophets. This is what prophets do. Just what I've done, warn you, provoke you to righteousness. That's the role of a prophet. A prophet is not to come and tell you, just take it easy, just hang in there for two years because you're going to get off the hook. You can live in rebellion and be off the hook. You come back and everything's okay. He said that's not how God speaks. Folks, you're not to be flattered. None of us are to be flattered when we disobey the word of God. We're to hear it and come under it. Folks, if there's something in me that's wrong, I want to hear a prophet. I want to hear a man of God. I want to hear a Jeremiah that would bring conviction to my soul. Convict me and, and, and shake me and wake me up. And folks, this, this is how you tell the difference between that which is a message of rebellion. The message of rebellion brings an ease and a peace to your heart. Everything is all right. Nothing's wrong with you. Everything's fine. You're not provoked. You're not stirred. You're not convicted. The message of the Lord will convict you against sin. Jeremiah faced another minister who rose up against God's appointed authority, and his name was Shimei. In fact, he sent letters to all the people in Jerusalem. And this rebellious priest, jealous again of the prophet Jeremiah and his following, he tried to undermine Jeremiah's influence and authority. He called Jeremiah a madman. He told the people to reprove him. And in one letter to Jerusalem, he said, Now therefore, why have you not reproved Jeremiah, who makes himself a prophet to you? He's not a prophet. He's lost his prophecy. He's lost his anointing. Why haven't you reproved him? Why don't you stand up against him? He said, in essence, Jeremiah has no anointing. You dare not listen to him. God said through Jeremiah, I'm going to punish Shemaiah and all his children because he hath taught rebellion against the Lord. He's taught rebellion against the Lord. How is it? That some Christians can rise up against God's appointed, anointed leaders and go about gossiping and slandering and disobeying the clear commandments of God. I'll tell you why. It's because they've had input from ministers who fed their rebellion and who have anchored them in their rebellion so that nobody can move them. You can, you can talk all you want to to these people. You can, you can show them the word. You can speak in wrath. You can speak in love. You can speak in any way you choose. But they are without understanding and they are established because there are preachers of rebellion. Folks, they're in many churches today with many doctrines that make people comfortable in their sins. Folks, I used to, on Sunday morning, when I was an evangelist and I was off a Sunday and I'm in a, in a city and I don't have a service till the evening, drive around and, and, and uh, churches, big churches, evangelical churches. And there, I, it's between services, between Sunday school there. And outside, outside, you talk about a smoke den. Elders and hundreds of people are out there getting 
couple drags on their cigarettes. And it used to so bother me because why isn't there somebody in that pulpit in there? Why isn't there somebody in there saying, hey, look, you, you don't want your kids to smoke pot and let you grow smoke in Jesus' face. And you go home and you drink your cocktails. That's nothing but liquid pot. And then you, you, you go around saying, oh, these poor kids, puff, that are dragging on those marijuana cigarettes, puff, puff, sip, sip. And setting that evil example. And then preaching against the immorality of the nation. No. It's called teaching rebellion. Now God gave Ezekiel a warning that that I've taken to heart and I want you to take to heart. Go to Ezekiel 2, please. Keep going right. To Ezekiel 2. And I want you to go to verse 7 and 8 with me, please. Ezekiel 2, verse 7. And thou shalt, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. Verse 8. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto you. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give you. Oh, folks, look at me, please. This is what God said. You have the example of Saul and, and how he lost his kingdom. When you think of Saul, here, an envious spirit comes in his heart against David so that he can throw a javelin at him. He even throws a javelin out of his, at his own son. Here's a man that has an evil spirit come upon him. He trusts no one, not even his son. He loses his sense of direction. God stops talking to him. His children suffer because of his sin. He loses favor with God and man. He becomes a tormented man. He can't sleep. He goes through the house raging like a madman. He ends up in a witch's den seeking advice. He dies a broken, sorrowful, sad, abandoned, rejected man. And you look at the life of Saul and that rebellion and what it does because he disobeyed the word of God. And then you think of us today. God says, don't you be like that. He said, you keep your ears open. You keep your eyes open. And when I speak to you, take it to heart. Take it to heart. Obey me. Don't be rebellious like this rebellious house of Israel. Folks, why do you think this testimony is given of a rebellious Israel and how God judged Saul, how he judged Israel so that we would not be rebellious like they were, that we would have the favor and blessing of God? Now, folks, I'm going to close in just a few moments, but I want to tell you the good part. (laughs) How many are ready for the good part? (laughs) There's a difference between Saul's age and today. Because we have a Savior who went to a cross. And then he ascended to heaven. And he seated the right hand of the Father. And now the message under the new covenant is reconciliation. It's that if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It so happens that in the New Testament, under the new covenant of grace, listen to me now, you can be in total disobedience to God. You run off like the prodigal son and you wind up in a pig pen. You've lost everything. You've lost the blessing and favor of God. You've lost everything that's possibly, that it could be dear and near to you. And now you're living in absolute rebellion against God. But the scripture makes it clear that because God so loved the world, that there came a time that he said, I give my own son so that any prodigal son can come to himself and say, I've been in rebellion long enough. And I'm going to tell you, God loved you when you were at the height of your rebellion, when you were an alien, when you were far, far from him. That's when he laid down his life. That's when he loved you so much. And if he loved you so much then, how much more? Folks, when you just get out of your spirit of rebellion, when you say, oh God. Now, folks, here's another difference. We have an indwelling Holy Spirit who does not hide his face. And if there is something that has come upon you by the enemy... 
You, that's the one thing about the Holy Spirit. If you have a root of bitterness or rebellion in you, the Holy Spirit, if you ask Him to, will show it to you. Not only will show it to you, He will help you pluck it out by its roots. He will show you the grace of Christ and He will bring you to the cross. He will reconcile you to the Father because when the prodigal son just made an effort, came back, <clears throat> he was not only forgiven, his father ran to him, kissed his neck, put a robe on his back, a ring on his finger, and put him at a feast table. <clears throat> I'm telling you now, that's what the cross was all about. That when the enemy came in like a flood, even when the devil came to try to deceive you, you, you may be sitting here some, this morning and someone uh, picked up the telephone and called you with a piece of slander. It could have been against the pastor of this church. It could have been another Christian that was slandering. And, and you just listened to it because the devil put a hook in your jaw. He, 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 there was something curious in you. And you said, well, I want to hear the story. You heard the story all right, but it got into your spirit. And it began to take away God's favor and blessing in your life because it began to eat at you. And folks... God knows, God knows that you fell into temptation. But you're sitting here this morning, you say, Brother Dave, I want to please God more than anything else. And I think this is the way God ministers His grace. He looks into the heart. Now see, He looked into Saul's heart and He saw nothing but a hardness. There were, Saul, no matter what God would do, no matter how the Spirit would strive with him, because the Spirit strove with him again at Ramah. The Spirit of God came on him, gave him another chance. He got up and went out in his rebellion. And God will look in your heart, and even though there's been something there of rebellion and disobedience to the Lord, I don't care how you've fallen or what you're involved in, God looks deep in the heart. And if he sees that cry, Oh God, I want to live pleasing to you. I want to live a righteous life. I want to be a holy man, a holy woman. Not having my own righteousness, but I want yours. And I know that you're my advocate before the Father. And I know that when I can't pray, the Holy Ghost can pray in me. So Holy Spirit, come upon me. Pray me out of this. Pray me through this. Because I want a clean hand. I want clean hands. I want a pure heart. Folks, that's all it needs. It's that gut cry we talk about so much. The Lord will come and deliver you. Forgive you, cleanse you, and make you stronger at that point than you were when you started. But if you continue in your rebellion, see, it's one thing to have God tell you something, and you disobey Him, and then He comes time and time again to you in love. And he speaks to you, read it, it's there in verse so-and-so, and you read it, and there it is. It stands right out against your disobedience. Forgiveness. And if you won't forgive, after all of the efforts of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of reconciliation, the probing of the Spirit, the conviction of the Word like you hear this morning, and then if you get up and walk out and say, well, I'm sorry, no matter what you say, I can't let this go. And I, I'm speaking primarily about a root of bitterness. And God made this clear to me that I had to speak this out this morning, that there were people here this morning that had roots of bitterness, and that leading to rebellion, and will lead to hardness, where nothing of the Word, nothing will ever touch you again. And even though the Lord loves you, and wants to be reconciled to you, because you set your face, and you are not only bitter, but you are embittered. You are set in your bitterness. Folks, today... In the next five minutes, run. Don't walk. Run down here and say, Jesus, I don't want to end up hard-hearted where nothing touches me. I don't want to wind up with a spirit of rebellion and be under the seduction of witchcraft spirit that will hold me in its hands. Will you stand, please? <clears throat> balcony the main floor you heard what the Holy Spirit said <clears throat> you heard what he said don't carry it another minute you you know what's in your heart Holy Ghost doesn't have to pound you over the head you know exactly what the Holy Spirit's saying to you and up in the balcony come down go to the stairs on either side and come down any aisle 
Move in close, please. There'll be a lot of people coming. Heavenly Father, in your great love and compassion, speak mercy to every heart. Holy Spirit, go and probe now. Lord, point out every, every root of bitterness, every root, every grudge, everything, oh Lord, that's unlike you. Come on, bring it. Bring it to the Lord right now. We're going to deal with it. God's going to pluck this out. <clears throat> please move me close and fill up every little hole there, please, if you will. God bless you. Been on my heart all week. And I'm saying, Lord, what are you trying to say? And even this morning, I just sat here under the burden of the Lord. God, what are you trying to say this morning? And I hear it so clear in my heart that there are many, many here this morning that still have not laid down those roots of bitterness. Uh, some, some of you even have a hatred in your heart towards somebody that has wounded and hurt you. And, and you just can't seem to get it out of your heart and your mind. It's still there. You, you say, I forgive, but you haven't from your heart. It's still there. You've said the words, but it's still there. The root is still growing. It's got to be plucked up by the roots. You have to be willing to lay it down. You have to be willing to say, God, I don't want this anymore because it could cost my life. And it will. It'll cost your life, your spiritual life. It'll cost your health, your physical health. Nothing, nothing brings more disease than a spirit of bitterness. I mean, it can give you heart attacks. It can give you cancer. It can do anything. I believe that a majority of our diseases come out of a spirit of, of, of uh, unforgiveness, comes out of bitterness in somebody's heart. I don't care who hurt you. I don't care what they did. doesn't matter whether they're saved or unsaved. It could be the worst devil in the city that's hurt you and wounded you. In, in the heart of, in, in the form of a person. There has to be forgiveness. Right now. Doesn't mean you're going to be best friends with them. Doesn't mean you have to go associating with them, but you've got to get it out of your heart. You have to get it where, where you're not wanting revenge. You're not asking God to hurt them. You're not saying, God, get them, get them. <clears throat> Lord, you know what they did to me? <clears throat> get it out. Folks, that, that kind of seed is possible in the most holy, righteous people on earth. Will you examine yourself now? Congregation, examine, because I have to stand before the throne of God and answer for this this morning. I have to stand and answer for what I tell you. <clears throat> and you're not going to go to hell under my watch, or Brother Carter's watch. Because we're going to keep probing and probing, because God, God does this for a reason, because of His love. He wants you to enjoy health. He wants you to enjoy freedom. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to walk out of here tonight, like this morning, like you have a ton of bricks rolled off your back. You're not carrying around this dead body anymore. How many of you want to get rid of it right now? You say, Lord, keep your hand raised right now. And I want you to pray this from your gut, right out loud. Hear it loud and clear. Pray it loud and clear. Dear Jesus, I am sick and tired. Of this thing in my heart. I want no root of rebellion. No root of bitterness. No spirit of revenge. I want to be free. Help me, Holy Spirit, to lay this down and forgive from my heart. Truly forgive and have it removed so that I can honestly Pray for those who have hurt me. Now let me pray for you. Father, I come against, in Jesus' name, I come against this spirit of rebellion. It's a spirit of witchcraft that's going to try to hold, through seduction, hold people in bondage. I break those chains through the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Every chain of bitterness that binds, every root of bitterness, I command, Father, they be plucked up. Let us cooperate with you through the empowering of the Holy Ghost. Empower us, Holy Spirit. Give us the power. Give us the anointing, Holy Spirit, to reject this, to lay it down. Now, while you are in the presence of God, you make that commitment. I want you to spend just a minute talking to the Lord right now. I want you to name that person underneath your breath. I want you to name him, and I want you to start praying for him right now. Lord, bless Mr. or Mrs. Bless in the name, 
you don't have to say the name of someone here next to you, but I want you to pray for them right now. God, put a love in my heart, put a forgiveness in my heart. Let me not take it away from this auditorium this morning. I'm finished with it. It's over. If you make that commitment, God will honor it. You have to make the commitment. You have to give him your will. He will empower your will. He will give you strength. Hallelujah, Lord. Name it. Name that person right now. Just name that person quietly. I don't want to hear it. Just breathe it out in prayer. Lord, name that person. Say, I want to lay it down right now. And by an act of faith, just lay it down and trample on it right now. Just lay it down. Lay it down out at your feet and trample on it right now. Lord, here it is. Take it. Take it. Go ahead. Do it physically if you want. Go ahead and stomp on it. Thank you. Glory. Lord, I want it out.